But I think it's almost a mistake to walk in somewhere and someone say, yeah, I'm rushed off my feet. Don't have time to do this. If that's the case in your machine shop, that's wrong. You're doing something You're wrong. You're doing something wrong. Welcome to this week's MTD podcast. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing the most overlooked elements of engineering. I'm Giovanni Albanese, today's host, and I'm joined by the one, the only, Paul Colin. Jones, oh. with 26 years experience in engineering and the founder and the managing director of MTD. I'm also joined by the one and only Silver Fox, yeah. the Silver Fox himself, Colin Griffiths. The director of the network. Can I, do you dye your hair, Gio, before you start abusing my hair? No. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I use just for men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Welcome, gents. Well, good afternoon. Well, yeah, afternoon. Mm. It's gone fast today. Now, this podcast is all about overlooked elements of engineering. And what we mean by that is how many processes do we see when we're on the road that are not really at their full potential. So maybe, for example, someone's got a machine tool, but they're not utilising that machine tool to its full potential. We've done podcasts in the past. I'll give an example with Cogsdale, where you actually, Paul, done a video at HF Mixings, yeah. where the gentleman said, I can't remember the guy's name, but he said that he uses a burnishing tool and it saved him 10 hours of grinding operation. So it saved him an employee on a grinding machine and the transfer from the very large components onto a grinding machine. So the savings in a product like that are instant. Yeah, he's uh, taking the, the, the return out, of, yeah. of invest. So these are the kind of things I'd like to touch upon today. Paul, have you got any examples? Oh, God, there's a whole array of them. And I think it's where do you start with this and how... Deep, do you take it? I read Colin's my list. Covering up his list. <laughs> I mean, I think it can be down to as things as simple as buying a turning machine that's a lot better quality with the right tooling, the right inserts to be able to produce ground finishes or as close to ground finishes as possible, therefore eliminating the grinding operation. Or that sort of toes in line a little bit with the burnishing that you're talking about as well. So it's about getting components through machine shops more efficiently and more effectively. It could be as simple as buying a machine that's got more axes on it, that's capable of doing more operations, milling, drilling, boring, tapping, threading, U-drilling, gun drilling, and all of those elements all in one operation or on one hit, I should but say. But if the coolant's not right or the cutting tools are not right, then it's only as yeah. strong as its weakest link. I use your 100%. You're absolutely <laughs> right. On. But, so on. it depends on what I see many, many examples in machine shops where I look at things and I think, you're doing that all wrong. You're doing it wrong. But it's very difficult to tell someone that you're doing it wrong and there's a better way to do it. I went in a machine shop the other day and the guy was using a machining center with one vice and he had what he was doing prismatic parts and he was machining one face. He was opening the door, blowing it off, turning it over, clamping it up again, machining the next face. Come on. I mean, you Did know, you really, why? really. Know you yeah, can... yeah, yeah, you, you do. I said, what, have you not considered maybe a modular work holding system where you can, you know, palletization, e even robotic automation to get away from doing that? I don't need any of that. This is the most efficient way. Okay, do you realise then that your machine is less than 40% efficient? No, it's not. It's running all the time. It's not. It's not running all the time. The no, spin no. So these are examples. Also, going into a place and seeing someone machining and seeing the swarf build up in a part which will affect surface finish. It will affect the accuracy of the tool ovality, of tool longevity. There are so, so many factors through spindle coolant doing operations without through spindle coolant. When clearly if you use through spindle coolant, you'll get a faster machining process. You'll clear swarf away. You'll get a more accurate hole. You'll, it's all of these things. So what can, can, can I, 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 go, I go want to go back to you. Pretty much your first point though, you're saying having a machine that does this, this, milling, turning, debearing, whatever it might be, oh, it's going to cost me a lot more money. Well, actually, have you looked into it? Because it might cost a little bit more, but many a time they've actually taken that next step. It's not a lot more. And with my finance head on, in terms of if you can finance it, it probably isn't going to cost you that much more per month anyway. So just that little bit of extra investment will get you so much more, better cycle times, less operations, better finishes, like that guy taking it out, 
in turning turn around. Over. I mean, just accuracy straight away. And the vice he was using, it had like one of these pins. It was like a, what do you call those things? Well, I can't even remember. 1960s style like technology. Thing and he butted it up against it. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not a secure datum point. That is not, you're going to get... Probably said, what's a datum point? Yeah. <laughs> so let's assume that the end user has chosen the correct machine for the application. So the machine is the foundation for everything to come from. So why it is the foundation though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, That's yeah, key point. absolutely. So we're assuming that the machine tool is correct. So why are so many elements of the process overlooked, such as, let's name a few, coolant, one, high coolant pressure, two, automation, yeah. cutting tools, burnishing. Tool holders tool holders. Now, cool. all of these different elements create the perfect process. And without one or the other, or without just one, you're not achieving your optimum state of efficiency. So why is it down to education? What it's down to is every day of the week, you are traveling around machine shops, seeing how people are doing things differently. You have the luxury of being able to afford to comment and afford to think because it's not your money it's not and this is the reality of it it's not my money it's not your money it's and you have that luxury of seeing all these different examples of the ways people are doing it unfortunately having worked in a machine shop I say unfortunately for that but yeah, when I worked in, when <laughs> I worked in a machine <laughs> shop you get closeted into the way that you're doing things and you build a relationship with a cutting tool supplier, a tooling supplier that might not necessarily have the right cutting tool for you or the right product for you, but he persuades you it is and you don't bother looking outside of those spheres for different ideas. So we are in a luxurious position where we get to see the way that things can be done. And you think how much time you do spend doing that. How on earth can someone be as good at making those analyses as you because they'd spending too much time actually in the business than on it. I think it's an extremely good point. Colin, you... I'm thinking it is about education, but also is it about the people who are supplying you, their relationships? I've got this part. You say, oh, I might sell you the wrong tool. If you're selling the wrong tool though, surely... I'm not going to go back to him. I'm going to use somebody else. You but rely it on that. It might not be the wrong tool, but it won't be maybe the best possible tool for the True. job. There are, when we look at, uh, you did a technical corner with NTK using ceramic tooling. Yeah, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Now that is perfect for some applications, but you can still do those applications with more generic type tooling, but, but you not just as won't, quickly. not as quickly. But if your tooling supplier doesn't sell ceramic tooling, or doesn't think about ceramic tooling, you may not go down that path when really you should, because it would be the best mm. efficient. Right, let me look at it from this tooling supplier. Sorry, tooling sorry. suppliers might be a bit wary. Well, actually, we don't. That should be a ceramic tool in use, but they don't want to recommend it because they'll go somewhere else. But if they've got a good enough relationship, surely they'll stay with them. And say, look, went ceramic tool route, but we can stay with it for everything else. Just building that foundation. You're up to the wall. Up to the walls now. I think that good relationships with your suppliers of equipment is very important. But I think that as a company, you need to do your own due diligence as well, 100%. And I think MTD is a perfect platform to do that. I'm sorry, but I've got to say that. It's mm. the truth. Yeah. You're getting but kicked the, under the table. That's a good thing that yeah. people should be going on MTD. But let's just assume then now that we look at a process. Like when I've visited and we've visited engineering companies, one of the first questions I always ask when I visit an engineering Where's company. Where's the toilet? It, that's the second question. <laughs> but the first question is always, are you busy? And before I get onto the shop floor, it's always interesting that I always kind of figure that I'll listen to their answer. 99% of the time, if they say, yep, yeah, we're flat out, we've, we're extremely busy, I go onto that shop floor and I see massive investment in all of the latest technology. Always. They're buying new machines, they're buying the latest yeah. products to make them more efficient, to make the machines run 24-7. When they say... We're not busy, we're struggling, we're making ends meet and this, that and the other. You go on the shop floor and it's like going back to when I've done my apprenticeship. And that is the bottom line of it, I'm afraid. I think that we mentioned before that technology and innovations are moving at such a rapid rate that we need to continuously stay with them. Great line, Tim Allen at MJ Allen, they've got a great group of companies. And he said, we've got to keep investing just to keep up with the pack, let alone ahead of the pack. And they're always looking at new machines and things like that, and new processes. They started out making patterns for a foundry. They're in foundry, huge machine. They've got some huge Dugards. JTS? Oh, the... From, no, no, DTS. DTS. Jumford. Jumford, yeah. Oh, what are they improving, Colin? What? It's just the fact that they're having to invest all the time yeah, yeah. just to keep 
up with a pack, let alone ahead of it. But we need, as a country, as the UK, we need to be on top. We need to invest in automation and all the latest technology to be competitive globally. That is the bottom line. Oh, you, you won't exist machine anymore. Shop. I won't say where it was. And I said, same question. I said, are you busy? Is and this the, a joke? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> and the guy said, no, not really. I said, oh, right. And I was kind of taken back. Oh, right. He said, but we're doing really, really well. And I was like, all right. And I walked in this machine shop. He had latest state-of-the-art machines being loaded by robots, all CMM equipment for the metrology. Yep. It was all top-notch. So really? the reason he's saying, no, he's not busy is because he's not rushed off his feet. He's not running from that machine to that machine to change this. He's being efficient. And, and that, that was his it. reason. But that gives him that. the time then to, to strategize, to think of his next steps, to think of what markets he wants to get into. When you're that busy and you're having to put your own time into doing the repetitive task, you can't think of the future. You can't look five years ahead and yeah. do your planning in that respect. Now, going back to what you he said- could spend his time and this is what he said to me with his customers he's talking to his absolutely customers absolutely yeah. brilliant courting his customers if that's a bit of an old fashioned <laughs> word but you know what I mean to, finding out what work he can take from them next and put through his efficient machiny environment what that to me was a complete contrast as an example to the company I'm talking about earlier where the guy's standing by the machine he's turning <laughs> totally the part the over he's got two minutes for me on a video he's, I've only got two minutes to tell you about my business whereas this other gentleman has got an hour an hour and a half which is great for and how him. many staff did he have there was probably about three or four in the so machine shop. Yeah. So not a lot, yeah. but those three or four staff were CAD CAM. They were highly skilled guys. Skilled engineers. Making sure that what they were making was the precision it should. So he's then able to spend the time to sell his business via our channel, whereas the other poor fella... Can't afford it. He can't afford it because <laughs> he's turning his parts yeah. over. And, and I think that there's a great analogy, like... I listened to Tony Robbins podcast recently and he said that his father used to work 50, 60 hours a week, harder than anybody. Again? And he couldn't afford to put food on the table. He'd done manual jobs. Part of that was probably how he spent his money. But then you've got other people that work less hours mm. that are worth billions, like kind of investment bankers where they're kind of, your interest in the bank for your, your savings might be 3% and they're is giving. So he's adding value to people. So this company, the technology for that particular company that you mentioned, is getting so much value by the investment in that latist technology. And it's a kind of an analogy, a, also a roundabout those, analogy that trying with to, the, the guys on the shop floor, he's only got three or four guys, they're skilled engineers, but they're skilled engineers. They're not just loading a billet all day because that's just such a waste of a skill. They should be doing engineering. But he's a visionary. The guy yeah. that's done that, he's looking for the next yeah. best thing, the, for the solution. He's thinking out of the box mm. and he's thinking, so how can I do this better? How can I do this faster? How can he's I make using, more money? He's using how skills can I... of his engineers are as well, which is yeah. what... You Absolutely. Know, but he's for. looking, ultimately, reducing cost per part. That Absolutely. is the key. If you're in a manufacturing, you need to reduce cost per part. That's the key. Yeah. So if there's anything that can help you to reduce that cost per part, you need to be embracing that. I mean... And he's... Done is do dunglance. Did you do, call it do, do, do diligence? Do, oh, that's the one. Do, do diligence. diligence. <laughs> <laughs> Did I pronounce it incorrectly? No, 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 you're time. right. I'm wrong. I was out with one an, in an engineering firm. Well, I actually popped out there last week and they do a lot of machining castings and things like that and heavy pieces and the milling and they're doing a fixed head turning. They've invested in their first slider recently. He goes, well, this part here, A, more accurate, better finish. It used to be two and a half minutes without operator intervention, which we were having to do two ops. Now it's coming off in about 60 seconds. We're going from, saying about small batches and things like that, but this is a really large batch. They're doing 1,000 off now because of the pricing and things like that, 5,000 off and just thinking like but that the, and investing. It's and unbelievable. Just, yeah. but, this, but I think it's almost a mistake to walk in somewhere and someone say, yeah, I'm busy, I'm rushed off my feet, I don't have time to do this. That's wrong. If that's the case in your machine shop, you're doing something, you're wrong. Doing something wrong because you've got the work get it through the place quicker. Even things like a lot of, we learned last week about inventory, stocking product. You talk about a guy that's machining a thousand parts. He might machine 3000 so he can put 2000 on his shelf. Yep. So when his customer rings off, he can call them off. In order to do that, he's got to buy the material up front. He's got to have the space to be able to store it and stock yep. it. It's work in progress. You don't want to do that. You want to make a thousand. And then when your customer rings you up, you want to be able to adapt quickly enough to be able to make another thousand quickly. With that flexibility. Another, that flexibility. And that's a business process as opposed to a well, maybe. Something that's overlooked then in terms of like your process. You need your software because you've got these people. How do you quote? Oh, I do. I quote via an Excel spreadsheet. Software's key, it's, isn't I it? Mean, there's so much software now. You can go right for the very quote, holding your stock, your, your actual bar and things like that. 
and it does a whole process for you. you. Just press a couple of buttons at the beginning. I mean, it's not quite that simple, obviously, but mm. and you can reschedule it. Like I say, they phone up this morning. Oh, we're in desperate need. We need a thousand. Okay, hold on a minute. Yeah, we can have that in six months. No, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we can have it in Quickly. a couple of days. With AI and automation, a lot of people in the UK still think it's years away, five years away, ten years away, and there's a misconception that it's going to take jobs, but in fact, it's probably going to create jobs because if you don't invest in it, the companies won't exist. When you say any AI, though, what actually is that? Artificial intelligence. Yeah, what is it? It's a good it's question, Colin, but I think that AI is an analogy that a guy from Emo told us, and it kind of explains it quite well, is they taught two robots to communicate to each other in different languages. And within a minute, the two robots had gone through every single language. And then after that, they started talking their own language. They had to switch the robots off. Have you it's intelligent. Ter- Terminator or anything like that? But it's actually here. So with the way in which we are working regardless of the industry, whether it's engineering, whether it's different banking, the way in which technology is moving forward, it's making our lives easier. So our jobs will change, but we will have different jobs. They won't be the same as they were in the past. The the artificial intelligence, as I see it, is at the moment when someone programs a machine, they bring in all the necessarily tooling they need, they put in the cutting feeds, the strategy and all that. The artificial intelligence is continually recording what's going on in that machine. And then what it's able to do is adapt to get a better process process in place. I thought it was actually about... The initial, from initial, I need this part manufacturing, you almost reverse engineering. So that's a possibility, and that's what you're talking about as well. I thought, well, you could put a CAD model, basically. So if you had a part, Colin, in a drawing, you'd have to manually program it into yep. a CNC to make it. You'd have to do the operational process, so you'd have to plan it out, up one, up two, oh, up yeah. three, whatever. If, God, it has to right, if I did, it'd be a right mess. With the, say if you were putting a part onto a fifth axis a machine tool, we download the model and effectively it can write a program for you. Yep. If it knows what tools are in the carousel, so it could, it's got the same tools in the carousel all the time, it can cherry pick what tools. So if there's a rad in the corner that, I don't know, it's an eight mil rad and, and you might need to go in with a smaller end mill, it can go and choose a smaller end mill to, so it can think for itself kind and, of thing. And, and all, bit, on my point, going on from that, what I mean and think by it is, so it can do everything you're saying as well, just select those things. But once that process is in operation, it can detect the weaknesses and the strengths of that operation. And then if you do a similar operation or program a similar part later in that week, it will take into account and adopt some of those trends that it noticed from the previous machine. And say, actually, you'd be better off doing it like this because... I experienced that when I was machining that part earlier in Saves the week. Saves time all the time. It, it, so, so it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. thinking. It's constantly what saving time. Tool for you? Does it actually identify, it might be that you're using tooling on one job and that actual tool actually works really well. And perfect, we identify perfect. That That's and, exactly and, that. Yeah, exactly exactly that. that. That is exactly that. And you that. might program a part to run at 100 metres a minute feed rate and it'll go, whoa, no, 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 no. We did that last week and the tool wear was so high. Yeah. I recommend that you actually machine at 40 metres a minute yeah. because you'll get a better tool. So you probably so. have to put parameters in. So you'd have mm. to probably say, look, I want this tool to last 10 parts or yeah. I want this tool to last 100 parts. So the artificial intelligence may have some kind of parameters yeah. to work with. With. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I just want to give you another example because this was You've a really interesting one. It's, it's good. It's a good, company it's good. down yeah. on the South Coast yeah. and they were making pump bodies. And if you've been on the MTD CNC YouTube channel, you'll probably see who it was. I'll tell you, it was Metal Tech Precision. They were machining it. Basically, there was five phase, six phases of this pump body that needed machining. And the way they were doing it at the moment, right, when you go in this machine shop, you think to yourself, these guys are really successful business. They've been here for many years. I used to knock on their door back in 2002. They've got lots of machine tools. They did were, you sell them any? They were making these. <laughs> no, I don't think I did any. They were machining these pump bodies in six operations, right? There was three different machines involved. There was a turning center where they were having to machine out the insides of these bores and doing some interpolate or some turning on the outside. And they bring it back to the horizontal, refix it, do the second phase, refix it again to do the finishing. On this spinner machine that White House Machines Tools uh, supplied as a turnkey project, you would look at this part, we all would, and you'd go, you're doing it wrong. I'd have done that five years ago. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but you would have changed the method of manufacture five years ago, the quantity of parts that they had. Now they're doing it on this spinner machine, two operations, do the back face, load it onto a fixture. They can interpolate all the bores. They interpolate See the turn video, diameters. Course, video. The surface finishes are perfect. The ovality MA of the Ford, bores, MA4, MA mills, yeah. mills. They're yeah. using two. One M mill is machining 22 bodies. 
I mean, before they were the cutting tool costs were through the roof, different tools, the machining process, the guy to move it from one machine to another. It was Absolutely. just, and I thought to myself, why weren't you doing it like this before? Why weren't they? Just knowledge, knowledge. knowledge. If you don't know, you don't know. And yeah. that's I suppose the they're busy is, just machining. They don't think they're busy in the business. Yeah. They're you busy need to in be the business. I think that everyone, it's down to everyone, every engineer to kind of invest that time to educate yourself to what's out there. And can I, I hate to mention it. It's also the cost in terms of your finance. They've got to pay for it. But that's but not, if you don't, it's that catch 22. It's yeah. a double edged sword. If you yeah. don't invest, you're going to die anyway. So yeah. you've got to, you've oh, got to invest. But it's true. I think, let me go. I just want to go back a little bit, Paul. Earlier on in the podcast, you said so that we're privileged to see many different engineering companies on our travels. And that's where we get the knowledge and education from. And you are absolutely right. I used to think I was educated by traveling in my previous sales role, but I was only looking out for certain elements. I was educated in work holding machine tools and cutting tools, but there were so many different other processes that I overlooked personally. And one of the biggest examples for me is that I can genuinely give, I always used to overlook coolant. I just thought coolant was coolant, basically. It is, it is but it isn't. <laughs> I used to just assume the coolant kept the cutting tools lubricated and it doesn't really matter which coolant you use or how you manage it. But the effects that coolant has on an engineering process are so significant and the money and the return of investments that are achievable from something like coolant are just astronomical. And we are give massively... Me, give me a figure that, so I'm not running my coolant properly for whatever reason. I get in a machine or a system that will do it properly. What sort of return on investment? So you can imagine if you're not looking after your coolant properly, the first thing is, is that your bacteria will get into your coolant and then you've got reduced sump life. You have to replace the complete machine's worth of coolant. That's expensive. I don't know exact cost, but I'd say a thousand pound downtime on your machine yeah. being down by having to change the coolant. Once you've actually got the right coolant, what does that do? It increases tool life significantly. It keeps being cool, I suppose, <laughs> but your tool life goes up. Yep. So you not wait, like an engineering company's biggest outlay, apart from like maybe the machine tools or the biggest consumable outlay every year is cutting tools. So if you can reduce that cost, that mm -hmm. is massive. So that then reduces cost per part, what we talked about earlier. So cutting tool costs reduced, surface finish improved, consistency improved, scrap reduced. Wear the, on the machine. Wear on the machine because of the lubricant. Well, in the working uh, envelope, yeah. that's yeah. where it is. 24-7 running. But you can Absolutely. do it more confident. So you see where I'm going with this. Like all of these different kind of elements. Well, it's like tramp oil. I mean, and that's not you sitting in a garage working <laughs> on an engine. <laughs> this is a podcast. You can't see my face right now. Thank God. Not happy. <laughs> Sorry, I think oil. How rude! <laughs> I think we're dead lucky, and I think that going off on a little bit of a different tangent, it's all about education. And I think that also as a company, where it's our duty really to educate not only the end users that are using the equipment, but also to change the perception of engineering, so we can get the next and the best young talent into this Absolutely. industry. Thanks. I think it's our duty, really. I don't think there's anyone else that I'm aware of that do what we do. And I think that the government certainly is not doing that. I know that might be controversial, but they're not. I think, the, I think that there is a big skills gap in the sort of... It's massive old, skills Older gap. engineers, or something said the other day, older engineers, bit of a gap, but they are bringing new... But the, 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 I mean, it's probably the, not enough. They are, but... Grandpa. Well, I was just going to say, it reminds me of a story when I was working at Rolls-Royce, how things have come on and how education is so important because, and how changing and looking at your business and making sure you're using the right machinery is so critical. Because I used to work in this area that was actually called the Tool Room One, I think it was. And there was a guy called Frank Mubrak. I'll never forget it. <laughs> Not Big Frank. <laughs> yeah, Frank Mubrak. Right? And he used to Frank stand. Frank <laughs> And he used to stand on this lathe, right? All day, eight hours a day, just turning these shafts and he'd be bashing his rule on the, he'd be trying to entertain himself while the Traverse is machining. Did he not, have, and could then he not he, watch MTD? And then he'd be <laughs> taking the swarf off and then he'd lift a part off, put another one and he was hand, or setting it all manually. And he came up to me one day and I was working next to him on this lathe and I kept scrapping stuff, right? And I genuinely did, I kept scrap. And it's because I was bored out of my, but I didn't enjoy what I was doing. And it all came down to the fact that for me, technology is everything these days. And he, it was such a mundane job. And I think that that is what, 
people think about engineering and it's so different. It did used to be in some instances those times because he come and whispered in my, he said, Paul, is everything all right at home? Are you all right? Because you seem to be making an awful lot of mistakes. And I was just like, no, Frank, I just don't enjoy this. I just don't enjoy standing on this duck board, turning these handles for eight hours a day. It was just it's so, not you. so boring. It's not me, no. Yeah. But when I went onto the CNC machines, it was more interesting because I got to read the sun, the sport, <laughs> all of those things. You catch up on the back pages. But didn't you enjoy, like, I'm assuming it was a manual machine. Didn't you enjoy sort of, you're crafting a piece of component there? Mm, you, not at all. Not, not if, if you're doing, doing the same thing every day. day. And especially if you keep if making repetitive. mistakes. And if you make a mistake, you can't rework. Oh, it was just a nightmare. What you would like is putting a chuck key in a chuck and turning it on. Have you ever tried that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try that because that is that uh, happened at college actually on my friendship lot, yeah. days yeah. yeah especially if you put we'll do it next time we go do somewhere we'll, put a chuck key put a chuck key in a chuck on yeah. a conventional lathe yeah and then the handle turn it on turn the chuck on the chuck key will go through. yeah that'll, that's got a massive little crash written all over <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. can we close the door first or? no there's no door it's a conventional oh, lane, so yeah. <laughs> is that like oh no yeah. yeah no it's a good story and it's a good I think that Thank there were some stats of, I think there's 84% of people Paul's work that was don't, crap they, <laughs> they don't actually get satisfaction from their jobs yeah. and I think that also, there's another stat that more and more people are becoming self-employed freelancers and they're getting more self-satisfaction from that because they're following their own dreams, becoming masters yeah. of their own destiny. And I think there's a big shift that it is changing, definitely. Well, Colin's a gigolo on a Saturday and he gets 84% <laughs> satisfaction out of his job. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. And I can't go self-employed with that either, yeah. I don't think I've all with that one. <laughs> So to conclude, what can we do about people overlooking? If people listen to this podcast, what- I think we have to encourage people to, and it's not just a pitch for MTD. We have to encourage people to use the internet, to go to trade shows, to educate themselves on how they can become what I would class as not busy. Would our audience benefit from us going out and doing educational presentations on the knowledge that we've gained from our travels and from the OEM products that we review on a weekly basis, would this be something that colleges, companies... Depends, depends who's doing it. Yeah, depends <laughs> who's doing it. Sure. <laughs> Don't look at me. I need, to, I need to sit in the audience. I'm learning all the time, Gio, as we know, but I'm not sure. I'm this might be a good option. Yeah, there's many... Uh, any vehicle we can get in order to, you just want people to, oh, they keep banging on about that. Pro I better have a look at that. Go and have a look at it. Oh, actually, yeah. I've seen it. Well, you talk about sliding head lathes. Yep. And it's true. You know, we've seen a big change in sliding head lathe intake in this country. It's massive. As a result of the work you've been doing, Colin, and I've been doing, educating people as to what those machines are now capable of. And in fact, there was two things that someone said to me recently about our channel. First, how they learned so much about how adaptable sliding head lathes are. And the second, which you'll find interesting, is about how we're now doing a lot more with laser cutting and how big the fabrication oh. sector is and how much it's changed from when they used to bend and fold the sheet. And that goes to referring to our other podcast about MTD Global, we've seen you know, some of these machines, they make such intricate parts with these benders, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not just a press break, it's just a, it's like a ballet coming. Yeah, you know amazing. what I love about the sliding head? Nothing. No. <laughs> it's got automation built in. People are buying that product with automation built in and they don't even think about it. And it is a money printing machine. This adoption should be made to milling machines, fifth axis machines. It should be part of the complete process a part of so when buying a machine it shouldn't be what automation should I put on it it should already come with automation it should just be part of the and I think that that's what it will get to I mean yeah. we've yeah, been to some of these way, big OEMs that they're all automation ready now or they've got their own solutions and I think that the proof is in the pudding there. You'd never dream of buying a sliding head with a short bar feeder on it, for example. No, no, no. And why should it be different for a fixed head? Why put a short bar feeder on a fixed head apart from floor space if you can put a long one on there? It's I don't know. Well, you liken it to the car industry, but it is they automated that. Yeah. Soon the cars will be autonomous to drive. Soon they'll be putting fuel in on their own. In fact, the other day I put diesel in the Escort. She's in hospital now. She's recovering. <laughs> oh, dear me. On that note, oh. thank you very much for joining the MTD podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast channel. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. But for now, that's it for this week. MTD podcast. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, Cheers, Joe. Thank Cheers, Paul. 
Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.